Welcome to this video where I discuss the floodplains along Swamp Creek in Kenmore, Washington. Um, the video that you're watching right now is the first video of two, and I, I broke the video up into two parts to try to keep them at a reasonable length. The first video deals with some background information and where to find some of the data. The second video will actually show um, the looking at the FEMA floodplain maps along with some photos of some recent flooding that had occurred in December 2020 and January of 2021. Uh, I do want to say up front that this video is just really just made just for informational purposes. Um, it's not to provide any type of advice on any one specific uh, situation with regard to floodplains or flood insurance. If you have those type of questions, I recommend that you contact your county floodplain manager and, and they should be able to help you with that. So with that being said, I wanted to show some of the, the background information and where to get this information. Um, and the first thing I want to do is actually show um, where Kenmore, Washington is. And I have, uh, so I'm looking at the uh, uh, NOAA website and I went to this website to get the rainfall data from December and January for those two events. And you can see here it's water.weather.gov slash precip. So you can go to and put your address in and you should be able to see uh, how much rain fell um, over a, a specific period of time. And so what I did is I, I picked a day when we had uh, no rainfall in this particular area. So that way it'd be a little bit easy to see. So this mark is showing uh, Kenmore City Hall and we're looking at Swamp Creek which uh, is about in this area here and it, it extends all the way up to Everett. So basically it extends northward from Kenmore, basically northward from, from Kenmore. So if we go look at the rainfall that had occurred during these two events in December 2020 and January of 2021, uh, a couple of things to define here. UTC is just Coordinated Universal, uh, universal Time. And uh, for the time of year that we're looking at, it's uh, to get Pacific time, you would just subtract eight hours from it. So this graphic would be from December 20th. So it's a 24 hour period or one day period from December 20th at 4 a.m. to December 21st at 4 a.m. And you can see from the scale that you had anywhere between maybe a tenth to a quarter inch of rain during that time period. So not a whole lot of rain during that time period, but enough to to get the ground somewhat wet. If we look at the following day, you can see that we actually got quite a bit more rain in the Kenmore Northwood area. So it looks like you got about an inch and a half of rain. The next event was closer to mid-January of 2021. It looks like it's uh, in the a uh, 24 hour period that ended on the morning of January 12th, you got about an inch and a half of rain um, right around the Kenmore area and further north what it looked like it was about an inch of rain. And then the following day, again, you got about an inch of rain, it looks like a little bit less as you move northward in the basin. So that gives you a little bit of background on where to find the rainfall data and how much rainfall had occurred during those two days. So if you're interested in knowing what the flow is in a stream that's around you, you can go to USGS and I noticed that we do have a USGS gauge, Swamp Creek at Kenmore. And this is, by the way, the area that we're going to be looking at when, in the second video when we look at the photos and the floodplain tends to be right in this area right here. So between 80th and 73rd. But I noticed that we had a gauge there, and um, so I was excited that I had a gauge there because I thought that I would be able to get the flow for this particular event. But unfortunately, as you'll see in the next slide, the gauge uh, was discontinued, I think, around 1990. But I was still able to get some information. So the drainage area at this point is about 23.1 square miles. So obviously it'll be a little bit less as we're looking in this area here, but it's, it's a little bit over 20 square miles that we're looking at. 
And this is the historic data. So it looked like the gauge was running from 1964 to about 1990. On the y-axis, that's giving you flow. Or this is the peak for each year in cubic feet per second. And obviously on the x-axis, that's the, the years. And you can see that the highest flow that was recorded during this time period was close to 1,100 cubic feet per second. So, um, and again, since I don't have the values from December and January, I'm not quite sure how that event compared to any of these. The next thing I wanted to discuss, I'll be talking about the floodplains and uh, so I wanted to try to define the floodplains. So um, there's a what's called a floodway and a floodway fringe, and those together make up the 100-year floodplain. You also hear me talk about the 500-year floodplain, which is going to be at a uh, wider extent than the 100-year floodplain. And you can see also that you have what's called a surcharge area. So if you want to know what the floodway is, if you want a very simple definition, I, um, I, I tend to say that it's the area where you'll find the main flow in a channel. Um, and for most people who are interested in that, that's probably you know enough for them to understand that that's the floodway. And it makes sense based on the, uh, based on the term. That's what most people would expect that to mean. Um, a, a little bit more detailed explanation is that if you were to fill in this floodway fringe to an extent where you would get this surcharge or this rise in the 100-year water surface elevation um, of up to one foot, so you couldn't exceed one foot in the surcharge, uh, but you can go up to one foot of this fill, basically that defines how much of the floodplain is actually being squeezed in um, and then the limits of that squeeze, right, these, this line and this line, then define the floodplain. So basically, if everything out here was filled and everything out here was filled, um, then you, you would get up to a one-foot rise in 100-year water surface elevation, and then those limits define the floodway. So again, it's a little bit more detailed explanation. So there's a lot of words on this slide. I'm not going to go through all of this, but I did want to point out here that it says in densely populated areas with existing development, even the allowable one foot increase in depth of flooding could significantly add damages, add flood damages to upstream property. So FEMA has uh, their minimum requirement of a one foot rise to define uh, um, the floodway, but that doesn't mean that every county develops um, or allows for any type of rise uh, caused by development in the floodplain. And um, I went and pulled some of the King County, by the way, this Swamp Creek um, area that we're looking at is in King County. And it says um, uh, the proposed floodplain development in the FEMA floodway must have documentation certifying no rise, which means that there is no uh, impact. So, um, uh, FEMA has a, a certain guidance, but then the counties can have a more restrictive guidance, which in this case, uh, King County is, is wanting zero rise for any type of development in the floodplain. So here's a definition, some of the floodplain definitions that you'll um, encounter um, in the next video. And it says here that there's uh, zone AE, and this is the area that's subject to inundation by the 1% annual chance flood event. Um, and you'll hear this called the 100 year event. Um, so they, they tended to move away from what we call these recurrence intervals, the 100 year event, because I think that it was creating some confusion. Because if you tell somebody that, you know, you're in the 100 year floodplain and they think that it's something that um, will occur every 100 years, um, but statistically speaking, we just don't know. So it's probably more appropriate to think of the 100-year floodplain, um, maybe instead of thinking that it occurs once every 100 years, maybe it's more realistic that it occurs five times every 500 years. Or it would be even more realistic if you said that it occurs 10 times every 1,000 years, or even 10,000 times every 1 million years. Um, 
So, and I think that what would create some confusion is that if you have what's called the 100 year event occur two times in say a 20 year period, then people might think, well, that can't possibly be the 100 year event because it occurred two times in a 20 year period. Um, but that may not necessarily be the case. So it, it could mean that we have to put that data in back into the statistics and maybe we do recompute the 100 year event. But just because something occurs two times in 20 years, it doesn't invalidate that being the 100 year event. And that, that can get to be somewhat confusing. So um, I think that they tried to switch over to more of a percentage based terminology as opposed to this recurrence interval terminology. Um, but you'll hear me, I'll, I'll still use this 100 year and 500 year floodplain. Um, your uh, zone A is also in this 1% area, but instead of being determined by a detailed study, it's determined by approximate methods. Um, you have shaded zone X, which is the area between, basically the area between the 100 year floodplain and the 500 year floodplain. So it's less likely to flood um, than the 100 year floodplain. Um, but it just happens to be between the 100 year and the 500 year. You have uh, zone X unshaded, and that'll be the area that's actually outside of the 500 year event. So it'll take something more than what's, the, what's been computed as the 500 year event to flood that area. It doesn't mean that it will never flood, it just means that it takes something greater than the 500 year event. So if you um, tend to like to think about things in terms of 100 year and 500 year event, but someone is uh, talking in terms of the percentages, um, the way that you convert it is you just take the inverse of the percentage. So for instance, if they say it's the 1% annual chance event, it's just one divided by 0 0.01, so the decimal version of 1%. And that gives you the 100 year event. Um, 500 year event is just one divided by 0.2%, which gives you 500. So here's a, a little bit of the probability of this. And um, so the probability of occurrence is one minus, one minus the probability raised to the power of n. And um, if you look at just this part, one minus the probability raised to the power of n, that gives you the probability of non-occurrence. So basically all you're doing is subtracting that from one to get the probability of occurrence. So if we look at these terms, we have two unknowns. We have the probability and we have n. So basically the probability for the 100 year event is just gonna be 0 0.01. Probability for the 500 year event is 0 0.002. And then n is just simply the number of years in the period that you are considering. So if you have the probability of a 100 year event occurring in over a 30 year period, um, and they tend to think of 30 year period as being, uh, they tend to use that because that's the length of many mortgages. Now you can see you have a 26% chance of that occurring in a uh, 30 year period. Now you might think that a 100 year event um, has a probability of occurring a uh, 100% probability of occurring in a 100 year period. But as we talked about before, that's not actually the case. So the probability of a 100 year event occurring in a 100 year period is 63.4%. Probability of a 100 year event occurring in a 200 year period is 86.6%, so higher percentage. Um, and you can look at this same thing for 500 year events. So probability of a 500 year event in a 30 year period is 5.8% and probability of a 500 year event in a 500 year period, again, it's not gonna be 100%, instead it's 63.2%. Okay, so that helps you to define the terms. Um, now you probably wanna know, well, how do I go and find the floodplain maps for my area? And this is the website that I use and um, you'll enter the address. And again, I just entered the address for Kenmore City Hall, but you can enter the address for your own um, uh, home or own property. Um, and what I did is I actually selected the dynamic map. So in the next video, you'll see, you'll see me working through the dynamic map and moving it around to look at the floodplains. But this is what it will look like, and you'll see the different zones. And we'll zoom in on this tighter and look at very specific areas and show photos and videos of that particular area. And this is what it looks like uh, zoomed out. And so you can see that you have a floodway. You can see that it crosses underneath Highway 522 and flows into 
the Sammamish River, which then flows into Lake Washington. Um, so I'm going to link the part two of this video to follow right behind this video. And uh, you'll probably find that one maybe a little bit more interesting because it actually has photos of flooding um, and, and a look at the floodplain maps. Um, again, I do want to point out that the photos that we're looking at are not, is, this is not of the 100 year event. The photos that were taken, it seems to be an event that occurs on a very regular basis, but it actually is a, um, a nice representation of, of flooding in, in a floodplain. So um, uh, thanks for watching this video. Feel free to subscribe to the channel if you want to know when other videos come out. And the video that shows the photos and videos of the flooding should follow right after this one. Thanks for watching.